Today we want to have a closer look at China's high-speed rail system. For a large country like China, fast infrastructure is important to connect cities and remote areas. In the 1980s, China only had old and slow trains with an average speed between cities of around 80 km per hour. In the 1990s, China bought first faster trains abroad and operated them with top speeds of 160 to 200 km per hour, which was already a big step. China works with five-year plans, so the government defines where China wants to be in 5, 10, 15 years, and the country works towards these goals. In China's 10th five-year plan from 2001 to 2005, the creation of a high-speed rail system was fixed. So China bought every high-speed train they could get. Just like with cars, China is a huge market for trains and Western companies were happy to deliver. But China had their own clever terms. They would buy huge amounts of trains, but the production has to happen in China with a Chinese company or with a joint venture between the Western and a Chinese company. At first this didn't work so well because China didn't have the facilities to produce these high-tech trains, so they were produced in Europe for example and shipped to China. But shortly after the first high-speed trains were produced in China and local engineers learned quickly. Chinese companies got licenses to produce these trains, but only for China, so they were not allowed to copy Western high-speed trains and sell them abroad. China named their first high-speed trains CRH, for China Railway High Speed. So these were Western trains from Chinese license production. The first train was the CRH-1, a Chinese production of Bombardier's Regina series. It started service in 2007 with a top speed of 200 km per hour. Just two years later, they introduced the upgraded versions CRH-1AA and CRH-1B, with a more aerodynamic shape and now up to 250 km per hour. Bombardier developed a new generation of high-speed trains for 2012, the Zephyro 380, so a new generation for 380 km per hour, which was designed at Bombardier's design center in Berlin. Of course, China wanted to have it and they made a deal. Chinese companies produced it as CRH380D in China and tested it with 420 km per hour plus 15% safety margin, which means 483 km per hour on the dyno. In driving tests, it reached 385 km per hour. The next system China was interested in was the Japanese Shinkansen high-speed train. Also here, they made a deal for their latest model, the Kawasaki E2-1000. In Japan, the top speed in service is 275 km per hour, but it is partly only operated at 240 km per hour. At tests in Japan, they could reach 362 km per hour. Now, in China, it was produced as CRH-2A. The Chinese floored it and reached 370 km per hour in test drives, but they operated it at 250 km per hour. But again, China wanted more. The Chinese rail companies massively increased power by using four instead of just two driven cars, so they increased power from 4.8 MW to 9.6. And the CRH-2C was now able to reach speeds of 380 km per hour. Another train China was interested in was the German ICE-3 from Siemens. Same thing here, China ordered the ICE-3 but 30 cm wider because they wanted to fit a fifth seat in each row. And with 8.8 .8 MW more powerful than the German version. Production should have happened only in China, but same thing again, the Chinese factory wasn't ready yet, so the first three trains were produced in Germany. China introduced the train as CRH-3 and again pushed it to the limit. The ICE-3 was designed for 330 km per hour and reached 368 km per hour in a test in Germany. Right after China had the German train on their rails in summer 2008, they pushed it to 394.3 km per hour during tests. Not even a year later, Chinese rail companies decided to produce a massively upgraded version of the German train with now 18.4 MW power instead of 8.8. .8. 
China could increase power by driving more cars off the train, but they didn't have much experience with bodywork and aero yet. So the look stayed the same and it was introduced in 2011. It reached a new world speed record for production trains of 487.3 km per hour. Based on their experiences and steep learning curve, the Chinese rail company upgraded the train with better aero in 2013. The unlucky number 4 was left out and the fourth western project was called CRH5. And it was based on the Alstom high-speed train, the producer of the French TGV. Same procedure here, they made a deal and produced it in China. It didn't have the tilting technology, so it was limited to 250 km per hour. China brought updated versions for extreme climate conditions such as desert storms and low temperatures, so they can use it in remote areas of China, where tracks are not built for highest speeds anyway. So from these four projects, Chinese train companies gained so much knowledge that in 2012 they decided to build their own high-speed train, the CR400, China Railway for 400 km per hour, now without the H for their own trains. While they learned a lot from operating the fastest western trains on the same routes, a problem was that with so many different trains, staff for driving and maintenance needed to be trained on each one of them, and spare parts were always different. But already now, a huge advantage was that travel time for popular routes could be cut down from 10 hours before to just 3 hours in the high-speed train service. Already in October 2013, high-speed rail was carrying twice as many passengers each month as the country's airlines. China has an interesting approach for designing their own high-speed trains. Just like Ferdinand Porsche and later his grandson Ferdinand Piech, they gave the same task to two different groups of engineers. Their train development center in Tsingdao, code AF, and Shangshun, code BF. And they produced both of them. First tests started in 2015 and the CR400 started service in 2017. Now, with their own trains and no longer a licensed production, they can also sell the high-tech to other countries. In the meantime, China also produced slower fast trains like the CR200 for 160 km per hour operating speed. This one will not drive on the special high-speed tracks. And they introduced the CR300, again designed for 300 km per hour and operated at 250 km per hour. The trains that I took on my recent China journey were every time the CR400 AFB. So the latest high-speed train in the Tsingdao version with 17 cars, 1,283 seats, 19.2 megawatt power, 438 meter long, designed for 400 km per hour and operating at 350. For the 1,300 km long journey from Shanghai to Beijing, we could arrive within just 4 hours and 20 minutes, although we stopped 4 times. That is an average speed of 300 km per hour and possible because the train drives at 350 km per hour constantly, even in the rain and even through train stations. How is that possible? In Germany, for example, the old ICE3 was designed for 330 km per hour, but there are only a few lines where it's allowed to drive 300. And pretty often there's some problem anyway and they don't drive faster than 250. So for the new ICE4, they decided to limit top speed to 265 km per hour, so a lot slower than the previous version. Deutsche Bahn said the race for high speed is over. High speeds need too much energy, wear out suspension and tracks quicker, and the development is too expensive. The German rail company spent 6 billion euro to buy 137 ICE4 trains. That means that one of the new slow train costs 44 million euro. The Chinese rail company, on the other hand, bought 168 of their latest CR400 trains for 453 million dollar, which gives us a price per train of just 2.3 million euro. So the world's currently fastest operating train is around 20 times cheaper than the latest slowed down German ICE. So 
why can trains in China drive at constant high speed and even through train stations with top speed? The reason is their clever infrastructure. The high-speed railway is a completely separate system, so high-speed trains don't need to share the track with cargo trains or other slower trains. In addition to that, the high-speed rail is around 10 meters above the ground at all times, so high-speed trains don't have to deal with railway crossings, falling over trees, animals or people on track, or flooding. Because of that, you also need less crossings with expensive barriers which need maintenance and slow down other traffic. All other infrastructure works as always, just the high-speed train drives above. The next point is that the Chinese high-speed train is a huge national pride. Everything for the greater good and so the track is built in a straight line through the country no matter what's in the way. And if a pillar is in the middle of the village, so be it. Because of the individual rights and also environmental protection, such a straight track wouldn't be possible in many western countries. And because they have these dead straight tracks, they can drive at constant high speeds. Another point is the design of the train stations. First of all, they are huge, very modern, safe and super clean, which are things we start missing in Europe. China wants to offer high-speed trains as an affordable service for everybody. So to prevent people from buying tickets for popular times like Chinese New Year in advance and selling the train out just to offer the trains for a much higher price when people really need it, you can buy tickets only 15 days in advance and it's linked to your name so you cannot give it to someone else. And because they have to board up to 1300 people for a single train in just 15 minutes, they need a good ticket system. If they would check everyone's ticket and link the person to the ticket with a photo ID, it would be chaos and take too much time. Instead, China uses their advanced facial recognition system which is linked to your national ID. So if you buy your train ticket, you put down your national ID number. And that of course also works with a foreign passport. When you arrive at the train station, you have to pass the security first, just to get in. The hall is huge with many gates like in an airport. You wait in front of your gate and not on the platform. Once they start boarding, they have a number of scanners for Chinese national IDs and a separate queue for all others. So the queue for Chinese people is a lot longer but also a lot faster. They scan their Chinese national ID and a camera is matching their face to it, which is super quick. Because the scanning of other passports might not always work and sometimes we have to check it manually, the separate queue has an inspector standing there. After I went through there for the second time, it already recognized my passport and the checking worked without a problem and much faster. You then take the escalator down to the platform because all train stations are on stilts above the tracks. So there are no tracks in the way when you want to go from one gate to another in the hall above and they only let people down to the platform if the train is already waiting there for you. That way, you don't have the problem of people falling onto the tracks and because the platforms are always empty with no one waiting there, trains can drive through train stations with top speed. My ticket from Shanghai to Beijing was 70 euro, which is super cheap compared to Germany and affordable for Chinese people if you compare it to flights. Children up to 6 years are free, 6 to 14 year olds pay half price. Chinese trains have 2 and 3 seats in a row for more seating capacity. The leg room is huge and you can even put your luggage between your legs and the seat in front of you. You have large overhead storage like in a plane and you can leave big luggage in an area close to the door. You don't need to worry about someone stealing your luggage because in China no one steals anything. You always feel very safe and there is a lot of service and security staff on board who even remind people to be quiet in a friendly way. You can buy snacks and drinks in the train like during a flight and you can even order takeaway from the next train station. The delivery service will hand it into the train to the stewardess and she will bring it to your seat which is an amazing service. Because these high-speed trains drive on their own special tracks with nothing in the way, they are always right on time. And because they are that reliable and affordable, it is real competition for flights. The flight from Shanghai to Beijing would have lasted 2 hours 10 minutes, so half the time. 
but with the additional time you spend at the airport for security check and waiting, the overall travel time is pretty much the same. The price however would be almost three times higher. And so in China, most people use the high-speed train service to travel within the country instead of taking the plane. And also remember that with 1,283 seats in the CR400AFB that I took, you can transport seven times the people that fit in a regular Airbus A320. So again, one train transports the same number of people like seven A320s. And that fully electric and reliably in every weather. The next step now is more speed. Because unlike the German trains, which get slower, China wants to reach 400 km per hour cruising speed for the next generation. The CR450. So it's designed for 450 km per hour and should operate at 400 km per hour. Because no other train in the world did that so far, China cannot rely on other countries' research for that. They have no reference and need to develop it themselves. Previous trains reached higher speeds during tests, but a regular service with passengers and at a constant speed of 400 km per hour is a different story. So again, Tsingdao and Changchun are developing their own versions. For the CR450, they designed a new front, the wheels are now completely covered and the train's surface and ceiling between the cars has been optimized for 22% less drag overall. They also increased the length of the front car for a better slenderness ratio, so less drag again, and they used lots of carbon fiber to reduce weight of the whole train by 10%, which doesn't help high speed directly but reduces stresses within the train and load on the suspension. The target which they claim to have reached already is to not be louder at 400 km per hour than the previous generation at 350 km per hour. The test report was published in December 2024 and they reached 453 km per hour top speed and drove more than 200,000 km in 200 days. So we could see the CR450 in service soon. One project they also bought in the 2000s was the German magnetic train system Transrapid, which you can still drive in Shanghai between airport and city center with a limited speed of 300 km per hour. But it was too expensive to build tracks with lots of magnets. China instead decided to focus on electric wheel trains and pushed this technology to the limit. For future projects, China is developing magnet trains, so hovering trains without wheels and rolling resistance, which drive in a near vacuum tube, so there is only a fraction of the drag. And because of that, you don't need magnets all the way, just every now and then to keep the speed. So very similar to the Hyperloop concepts. The speed for these future Chinese trains and tubes could be up to 1000 km per hour. So China experienced an impressive learning curve in train development. In just 30 years they developed from a land with slow train connections to the most advanced country in train development. Within just two decades they built the largest high-speed train network in the world with currently 48,000 kilometers. They can connect 97% of all cities in China with more than 500,000 people. In the next years, they want to expand to 66,000 kilometers, connecting 99% of all cities with more than 500,000 people. In 2025, 52 million people traveled between Beijing and Shanghai with high-speed trains and only 8.6 million took a plane. So high-speed trains are transporting six times more people than planes on the same route. China had an interesting and aggressive strategy to catch up and now develop the fastest trains in the world. And the best thing is, they really bring it into public service and it doesn't just stay a concept. I hope you found that insight interesting and if you did, please consider to become a Bsport Club member for early access and more videos like this. See you at the next one.